you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the Committee of the Whole, having risen, uh, would like to report back the recommendations. Um, the first recommendation is that Bills 182-33-COR and Bill number 183-33-COR be sent back to committee. And the second recommendation is that to place in the third reading the following uh, bills, bill number 153-33, uh, 154-33, 155-33, 155-33, and 157-33. With your patient, the uh, third reading file with no changes. With no changes, yes. Okay. On that motion, hearing no objections, so ordered. Thank you very much, Senator. The next bill then on the agenda uh, is Senator Munya Barnes, uh, bill number 26-33. Madam Speaker, if I may, if I can move uh, Bill Number 26-33-COR to the third uh, reading file, and if I can speak on it, please. And that's as introduced. It's as introduced, I'm sorry. Okay. You may proceed. <clears throat> uh, Madam Speaker, uh, Bill 26-33 is an act to add a new Section 10315 to Chapter 10, Title 5 of the Guam Code annotated, and this is relative to the online and public disclosure of medical licenses issued by the Guam Board of Medical Examiners. I want to share with you that uh, physician licensure information is a critical uh, piece of information. Um, every patient, prospective patient, and the public in general should be e easy to, should be able to access, Madam Speaker, and today, uh, through Bill 26-33, uh, we can make this important information even easier to access by requiring the Department of Public Health and Social Services uh, uh, Health Professional Licensing Office to put the information uh, which they already have online. Uh, I know we've explored uh, this uh, particular service before and with the newer technologies and the ease of updating information on government websites, posting the basic licensing information of our health care providers online should no longer be a service. It should be a standard section of uh, uh, the Department of Public Health and Social Services uh, website. Um, now, Madam Speaker, I, I know that the uh, uh, health uh, professional licensing offices uh, testimony submitted um, uh, testimony that they submitted contained some um, questions regarding the funding of this undertaking but uh, I want to share uh, with my colleagues and I must state for the record that merely posting a PDF file online uh, does not require or does not take uh, much time or effort to do. Um, I want to tell you that if you look at the website uh, of uh, Department of Public Health and Social Services, uh, DPHSS 
www.guam.gov, you see that it, uh, it is a neatly uh, organized and, a, and modern site uh, that they have online right now containing the agency's latest press releases, an announcement for the open enrollment period for uh, Medicare Part D. Uh, they have online uh, on their web an announcement for the General Mills Cheerios and Honey Nut Cheerios cereal recall. And um, they even have online uh, the notice that the agency's intent to employ a Mr. Brian J. Cui MS as the medical director for the Northern and Southern uh, 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 Public Health Center, Community Health Center, and they even show that it's at a salary of $134,000 per annum at step 10. Uh, I want to share with you, uh, Madam Speaker, that uh, with this latest news posted at the top of their website continuously, I, I have to commend uh, public health uh, uh, for the for the website that they have, and uh, and I think that this information is important, and most importantly, it's uh, up to date. So, um, and I also want to note that uh, just below in the section, uh, the agency there is the agency's latest news, where there is a section uh, that is also titled uh, on their web. It's called Important Documents. Uh, now this uh, currently, in the, in, in, in the section of, of the downloads, it contains four downloadable PDF files. Uh, and I wanna share with you that on, on that breakdown, it has a citizen-centric report a, and a few financial reports from a couple of, of years ago, of, from several years ago, and, and uh, I, I just want you to know, as I was looking at that, I, I hope they will update that soon, uh, because there have been late, uh, uh, recent information that we receive uh, quarterly that has been updated, but I want to share with my colleagues that it is clear that uh, Public Health and, um, has the website manpower and capability to make this really simple bill 26-33 uh, happen. I also want to make it clear that the bill doesn't require that public health go out and procure a webmaster or, and a new design with a whole new content management system. It only requires, Madam Speaker, that, that the health professional licensing office forward an updated list of health professional licenses issued for the quarter to the Department of Public Health and Social Services IT division, or whomever it's uploaded to, uh, where those nifty press releases are online for posting. Um, and the best part of this, uh, Madam Speaker, about this is the list can be provided by the Guam Board of Medical Examiners to the Health Professional Licensing Office as soon as it is updated. Um, it's easy, efficient, and above all, transparent, informative, and accessible to all. I also want to note that uh, not too long ago, uh, our good colleagues in this August body also uh, talked about having all the information and the good senator from Sinhanya, right, said that, you know, this is the way we need to go. True transparency, true accessibility, and making sure that as we look at the Patient Protection Act and making sure that all the patients here on Guam have that opportunity to look at all those who have medical licenses be posted and easy. Just, you know, nowadays, like my grandson said, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it, it's easy. Just like this, Grandma, just press this light, this button on, this, on my iPad, I know. And, and, and I say it like that, Madam Speaker, because if there is concerns about how this is going to be implemented, public health already has the templates in place, and you and I know that, uh, Sharing information and getting data and researching and just getting things online is just at a touch of our touch of a finger until that that piece of smart technology. So I really do hope that my colleagues look at this bill and give me that favorable support uh, as it will 
support all the patients looking uh, for to see what medical licenses are here uh, on our island. So thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak. I know I spoke long about this one. I usually don't speak this long, but I'm just saying it is something that is easy, something that can be transparent, and something where everybody can have access accessibility to. So thank you, uh, and Cesar Smasi. You're welcome, Senator. On the motion, anybody would like to speak on 26-33? I, I have a question, but I'm up here, so can I take a brief recess? The legislature is back in session. Is there anybody else who would like to uh, speak on Bill 26-33? There being none, on the motion then to send 26-33 to the third reading filed without any objections, so ordered. Bill number 29, that's 33, and I understand that um, this is the vice speaker and you have a substituted version that was uh, by the committee. Yes, Madam Speaker, um, I ask that uh, the legislature uh, accept the substituted uh, Bill 29-33 as substituted by the Committee on Transportation, Infrastructure, Lands, Border Protection, Veterans Affairs and Procurement, and further amended by the Committee on Rules. Uh, actually, I guess it was already accepted by the Committee on Rules, so now to place. All right, then. Yes, so, and you would like to speak on it? Please. You may proceed. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, uh, earlier this year when I assumed chair, um, oversight over the Attorney General's office, within the first month I received a, a letter, and it's included in the committee report from one of the attorneys at the Attorney General's office asking that um, I address some legislation which they had asked for in the previous legislature uh, for the legislature to approve a settlement that had that the uh, Attorney General's office had negotiated with uh, the estate of Jose M. Torres. And um, it didn't get through the last legislature, and so early this year, he, uh, the Assistant Attorney General asked if I would consider introducing the legislation. They had legislation attached, and, and I, I introduced it. Um, as you also know, earlier this year, a new attorney general assumed responsibility of the office. When we had, when the good chairman had uh, the hearing on this bill, she asked for some additional time to, to look at the, the bill, and um, with uh, the chair, with the committee and um, her staff, they they rewrote the bill, and that's why it's substituted. And but it still addresses what uh, the settlement. Uh, that had been negotiated between the Attorney General's office and the attorneys for the estate. And um, the other, um, it takes into account uh, authorizing the transfer uh, of the land to Guam Waterworks and then Guam Waterworks to, um, to I get Micronesia Mall. Or, but it, it's, it's a negotiated settlement and they just want to finally close this case, which has been lingering for several years. The other uh, amendment that was made was to make, make it clear that uh, any monetary amount that uh, is received, the government portion of uh, the settlement proceeds shall be deposited in the land bank for the Guam Ancestral Lands Commission. 
it's a fairly simple bill to try to um, finally bring to closure a settlement in the uh, in this litigation. And so I ask my colleagues for their support in in getting this bill through. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. You're welcome, Mr. Vice Speaker. On the motions, anyone like to speak on it? There being none, on the motion then to send 70, I mean, sorry, 29 33 to third reading file without any objections. So ordered. Uh, bill number 76 33, Senator Rodriguez, you're recognized. Oh, Senator, I, okay, so thank, all right, I will. I'll come back to you. Uh, huh? I'm going to move on uh, while we're waiting for copies that are being made in the next bill, but I don't see Senator Munya Barnes. I'm going to move over to Senator Tony Ada on 134. I hope you're ready. Okay. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, Bill 13433 is an act to rezone lot. Uh, move to the third reading, please. <laughs> I know we're in a hurry. Yeah. One it, day it was to done. rezone a lot that I want to move to the third reading. <laughs> okay, and you may you want to speak on it? Yes, thank you, Madam okay. Speaker. And it's an act to rezone uh, lot 3257-4-2 in the municip municipality of Sinahanya from agricultural to commercial zone. And uh, Madam Speaker, if you recall back, uh, back a couple of years ago when Public Law 297.31 was passed, and that allowed for the rezoning of the land in Sinahanya, this, this parcel of property from agricultural to commercial. And today, that piece of property is the site of a new and much needed dialysis center. And it's, uh, it's called The Village. And the author of that public law was our colleague, uh, the former uh, uh, Speaker Ben, who saw the need for the legislature to take action and that it would benefit our people for years to come. And because of the success of the dialysis, uh, dialysis center and the continued need for quality health care clinic, the owners acquired the, that small piece of property that is a, a adjoining uh, to it for the purpose of expanding the existing facility. And that property is zoned agricultural, and it, be need to, it needs to be rezoned for their expansion plans. Uh, Doc Safa was here at the public hearing, and it was wonderful to, he to see that he already had his architect and his, uh, his um, people moving on it, because he really wants to ensure that the facilities are ready to go as soon as we're able to, should we get the support to pass this piece of legislation. And I hope that once we, we uh, get this piece of legislation uh, moved forward and passed and it's signed into law, that Dr. Safa will be able to extend those facilities and people will be able to access health care wherever they stay. I mean, you know, we, we've done it in Manila where currently now there's a, a nice new medical center up there. Uh, Sinahanya is getting it. So, you know, making health care accessible to our people and making it closer to them, I believe, is uh, always, always a good and positive uh, uh, thing to do for our island. And I hope I'll be able to get my colleagues' support on this measure. Thank you, Madam Speaker. You're welcome, Senator. So on the motion to send 134, or, well, anyone who would like to speak on it? Anybody from Sinahania? Okay. Except for me. Um, None. So therefore, is there any objection to send 134-33 to third reading file? No objection, so ordered. I'm going to go back now again to, uh, are you ready, Senator Rodriguez? Uh, not yet. Okay, then um, Senator Munya Barnes is not here. Uh, then I'm going to go back to... Bill number 91-33 LS, uh, Senator Torres, and I understand you're sub you have a substitute? Okay, so do you have copies for everybody of the substituted version? Um, 
Yes, I want to confirm because I don't have my copy. All right, can somebody please uh, make sure that I have a copy? Mm -mm, I don't. Thank you. Okay, Senator Torres, on Bill 91-33. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I'd like to make a motion, first of all, to accept Bill Number 91-33LS as substituted by myself as the speaker, I mean, as the sponsor on the floor. On a motion, no objection, and that's to accept, so ordered, and to place now. Okay, I'd also like to play, make a motion, Madam Speaker, to place Bill Number 91-33LS as substituted by myself as the sponsor in the third reading file. Um, you want to and speak? if I may have uh, permission to discuss the bill briefly? Yes, you may proceed. Thank you. Bill number 91-33 LS is an initiative by the, the Guam Chamber of Commerce. And bill number 91-33 LS essentially is an act to amend certain sections of Chapter 70, Title 11, GCA, relative to the issuance of business licenses. There is a general sentiment in the business community that the, the renewal of business licenses as presently um, contained in the law is not business friendly. And they, the request from many in the business community is that we amend the law such that we don't have one common anniversary date for renewal of business licenses. Essentially, business licenses are renewed every June first of June annually and or every every year regardless of when you sign up for a business license and what this bill does is it it amends section 2 of chapter 70 title 11 Guam code annotated so that a person who obtains a business license on a certain month will have the renewal of his business license one year after the date of his application. And for those that have present business licenses, what this bill contemplates is that it will bring everybody back uh, to a point where they can have their licenses renewed um, upon expiration of the date that's current, concurrent with the date that they uh, issued the licenses or that they obtained the licenses in the first place. And so what we did is, is on section two, um, it changes it so that li all licenses shall be issued on an annual basis and regardless of when issued shall expire one year after the date for which issued or renewed. What we also did in this bill when there was public testimony at the public hearing, there were some concerns raised by the par Department of Revenue and Taxation that it's going to be impractical to do because they have a system in place and they don't have the software right now that will allow for it to happen and they don't have monies to spend on obtaining the software that will make it happen. Um, there was some concern about their ability to collect the, the, the taxes that are due because what this does, what presently um, they track all the taxes before they renew at the one time. What I'd like to point out, though, is that regardless of whether you have one common date for renewing a license or whether you have it throughout the year, it still doesn't affect the, the, the collection of taxes because everybody's obligated to pay their taxes. And what we've done, though, to address the issue of uh, the concern about whether, um, whether it's, it, you know, we can, we can graduate into this, what I've done with the bill also is I've provided that the Department of Revenue and Taxation will have up to 18 months to effectuate this, to bring everybody into this, this system. And to understand that, we just have to consider that should this bill be passed into law, at present everybody has renewed their licenses as of June 1. So the next renewal cycle is June 1 of 2016. So from, from the period that this bill gets passed into law, assuming it does, 
the Department of Revenue and Taxation will have that period to work the system out. And this bill also provides that, that they will work with, with the uh, Office of Technology to sort out those things. So we have the opportunity here to not only have the Department of Revenue and Taxation work the system over the course between when it's enacted until the next uh, round of, of um, renewals, which will be June 2016. It also allows them to understand what their true needs are working with the Office of Technology. And if there is a, a corresponding cost to implement this change in the in the, the process, that that cost can then be worked into the fiscal year budget for the fiscal year 2017. So the, the um, what it boils down to is we have a piece of legislation here that the business community believes is going to be a good thing for them. It'll alleviate long lines when everybody's rushing at one given time to, um, to renew their licenses. Some have the option of going online and they can do that, but most, uh, most right now go and line up and they find that a, a huge inconvenience. So this relieves that burden. And number two, with regard to legislation that is, uh, that, that is a little difficult to implement, this, the way that this legislation works is that it actually has a, a, a period where the department can ease into it. And it doesn't, uh, if anything, what it does also, the, the upside to this is that it allows for a steady stream of revenue into the government from the, the, the business license fees. And um, if anything, that, you know, that, that is a good thing as opposed to, to everything coming in only at one time. This actually fans it over and it makes it convenient not only for the business owners who want to renew their license, but it makes it convenient for the department who isn't reacting to a rush on the department by thousands of business holders who want to issue their license before the deadline. Um, so it, it, it has a corresponding good, I think, to the system. And we also have to consider that, you know, we're, we're looking at ways to improve our economy. We're looking at ways to entice businesses um, to come to Guam or to start up uh, current residents to start up businesses on Guam. So this just adds to the business climate. And again, I want to reiterate that it was uh, an initiative by the Chamber of Commerce. And I asked my colleagues to please give it um, their thorough consideration. Um, I've looked at all the, the concerns posed by the, both the, um, the Chamber who responded to the public hearing and the Department of Revenue and Taxation has to implement it. And I believe that the, this piece of legislation um, and all the amendments that I did in the substitute bill addresses all those concerns and actually makes it work for both parties. Thank you. You're welcome. On the motion, Mr. Vice Speaker. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I do want to speak on the bill, but first I would um, ask if the sponsor would yield to a question on the implementation. And your question? And uh, the question that I have is that the way that it's current, the bill is written, that the licenses will be 12 months. So it would seem to me that all current licenses that have an expiration date on June 1st will expire next year on June the 1st. That the only ones that will have new dates would or should only be those people who get new licenses between the date of enactment and next June. Because if the licenses are supposed to only run for 12 months, all of the, the 10,000 co companies that currently exist on Guam have licenses that expire on June the 1st. That's 12 to 12. I mean, that's 12 months. The only ones that, that could or should have a October, November, or December, January date are those who apply for a new license between now and next June. And I'm wondering if, if my interpretation of the implementation is incorrect. 
Senator, do you yield to the question? Yes, I, I yield to the question. Um, to the retiring speaker and those in the body, I want to refer you to page two, line one, where we inserted uh, subsection B. And the way that it's contemplated is, I understand that those present business license, current business licenses, all have an expiration date of June 1st. With subsection B, on page two, line one, it reads, all licenses and endorsements applicable thereto, which are already in existence prior to the enactment of this law, shall be renewed on the month consistent with the month they originally attained their license. The Department of Revenue and Taxation shall have up to 18 months from the enactment of the law to amend the renewal dates of these licenses and endorsements to conform with the renewal date outlined in section 70115 of this chapter. The way that this was intended is that come June 1, let's, let's say my business was, I originally uh, started up my business in September of whatever year prior to that. So come June 1, 2016, when I go to renew my license, my license will be good from July 1 through August 31st of the following year. So this is the, this is, this is the way it's going to be implemented. It's going to be prorated such that you, your license then is not for necessarily one month. And it's only initially to get everybody back to the date from which their, their um, licenses were applied for. Do you understand? So if, if, say, my date was September, I opened up my business in September 1, the record shows that I applied on September 1 of whatever year, 1995, whatever. On June 1, 2016, when I go to renew that license, the expiration date of my new license, my, my, my renewed license, then becomes effective July 1 with an expiration date of August 31st. So it's just the day before whatever and that's how and that's why I when we put this amendment in um, we gave up to 18 months because it's contemplating that from from point now when the when should this become enacted into law 18 months out it will give the department that opportunity to bring everybody to this schematic where they renew their licenses come June 1 they all get retrofitted into their proper months per the, the, the um, date that they opened up their, first got their licenses. I, I hope that that was a little clearer. Mr. Vice Speaker? Um, I kind of got that idea when I went down to B, but I'm trying to figure out what kind of convenience you're providing. If right now it's inconvenient to go once, you're now saying you're gonna have to go twice. You have to go June the, before June the 1st to to extend it from June the 1st to September the 30th, uh, um, to October, August the 31st, so that your new license starts back up in September. So you go May 30th, and you go August 30th. Not of the same year. So what's gonna happen is someone's gonna pay, rather than the $10 fee, it's gonna be 10 plus one 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 twelfth of ten dollars for for the license fee to get it to the and and that's what that's what the chamber of commerce recognizes and is willing to go through that one inconvenience in exchange for every year thereafter being inconvenienced with long lines and that sort of thing it, it was contemplated that there has to be a way to, to bring it forward there has to be a, a way to bring it forward uh, madam <laughs> speaker and, and initially this is the way that it, it's done and that's why you give them that period, anticipating that, that every, every month, um, you know, they're, 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 they're 12 months in the year, right? So every, everybody's renewal date uh, will change when they go in to reapply for their licenses next year. Mr. Vice Speaker? I understand what, what she's saying, so I, but I would like to comment on the bill okay. at this point. Thank you, I'm not necessarily George. opposed to it. I mean, I understand, but I really do think that it's imperative that we as a legislature understand the concerns of the, of the, of the department. 
the six or five people that work in that division that renew the licenses. And as I understand it, it's not so much software as much as just realizing that June 1st was chosen for a specific purpose. It was expected that everybody would have paid their taxes for the previous year on, by April the 15th. And so, therefore, on June the 1st, when you went in to pay to get your business license, the fact that you filed your taxes for the, for the year would show that you've been current in your taxes. And you would have the, a six-week-old filing to show that you're current and that you've accounted for all your income in your uh, businesses in, in, your, in your tax return. And so that was the reason why that date was chosen. It just wasn't some, legislat some legislator in the third Guam legislature deciding that June the 1st was his birthday and he wanted everybody to go to revenue tax. It was for a specific purpose so that they would be able to look at a, the most recent filing of taxes to determine whether or not that applicant was current. The other concern, as I understand it, from the employees at, public, at, at Revenue and Taxation is convenience, not so much for the, the, um, them at work there, but in order to be able to determine whether or not people have a current business license, those of you that have businesses know that you're supposed to post your business license in, in a conspicuous place, someplace at the entrance of your building, or in your behind the cash register, someplace that, that's conspicuous. And as I understand it from the employees, it's that if you look at the licenses, the business licenses, every year they change the color. Not because that's what we decided in core that was gonna be the color for the day. They change the color because when a revenue agent goes out, he can just walk into the business, look behind the cash register and say, wait a minute, that license is green. The last time we used green was in 2012. Where's your pink for 2015? Otherwise, they're going to have to go and look, go behind the cash register, go up to the, to the frame, look at the date and say, oh, all the, all the 2015s are pink, but I can't tell that date from standing at this point. So they have to go up. In much the same way that we have with our, our renewal of our, life, our, our tags on, on our cars. They're all color coded, but they're color coded for the year. But unless you have laser vision, which I, you know, sometimes the police do, sometimes they don't, that you may have the right color, but it's really difficult to see what month that license was renewed. And it's not until you run a red light or you're doing something or they're after you for some reason that they're going to stop and look carefully to say, your, your, uh, your tag should have been renewed in August, it's in now October, you're, and we're gonna pull you in for, uh, a re uh, you know, give you a ticket for a, a late tag. And so it's, it's convenience for the, for the inspectors to be able to go out and be able to immediately walk into a business establishment and know from the color of the tag that they're good for until June the six, uh, 2016. They're good until June of the following year. Otherwise, they're going to have to go up and ask permission to go behind every cash register and ask, is that a... June or July date on that, or is that, you, you know, if, what month was that? And as I understand it from the, um, from the um, employees of public, I mean, at uh, revenue and taxation, they also wanted me to convey to the members of the legislature that yes, all licenses are supposed to be renewed on June the 1st, but that does not and they wanted me to stress this, that does not preclude you 
from going in on May the 2nd, 3rd, 6th, 10th, 12th, 15th, any time, any time before June the 1st. As long as you can come in and show that you paid your taxes on, on, on uh, uh, July the, I mean on April the 15th, and you bring your tax form and show that, that you're current in all your taxes. So everybody doesn't need to go there on the 1st of June. They can go in there any time that they want to after they file their taxes in February. Just get the right color for the right part and wait until June the 1st to put up your purple one for, for, for 2016. I'm, I'm not saying I'm opposed to the bill. I'm just, I was asked to advocate the position of the, of the employees up there so that we as a legislature understand why a seemingly archaic practice continues. And if we're even having problems with people not filing their taxes for 20 years and getting renewed contracts in the government, We think that now they're going to be able to be able to walk in and tell who, who, who moved their date from June to, to, to September and who moved their date from June to August and what, what, what date should this be on this? I, it may be, be, it's just going to be really um, a mess. And I just want to convey that. That was the message that I was asked to convey and hopefully that you'll understand that their concern is not so much software because typing in those dates is not is not is not the major issue. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Is anybody would like else would like to speak? Senator Underwood, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I would like to commend uh, the author of this bill for uh, being really forward thinking and responding to the needs that had been articulated by the business community. And I clearly hear what um, the good previous speaker had noted about the limitations that we currently are facing uh, relative to even collecting taxes and the renewal of businesses. At the same time, I do want to acknowledge that, you know, revenue and tax lately have actually moved forward to allowing uh, businesses to renew their licenses online so that you can now renew licenses uh, as early as May and you can do it online provided that you are up to date with your income tax, you don't have a, you have uh, filed your gross receipts tax and so on so that there aren't any conditions for the renewal. And you know I, I do support the concept of this bill, I really do and I also hear the concerns of the employees because we wouldn't want to move anything forward that's going to end up may, failing or not being implemented correctly because it doesn't have the kind of support. So I, um, I would like to, to ask um, the author of the bill uh, just a question regarding, first of all, the the financial support and the training that would be needed as to whether that had been considered and that should be included as part of a precondition to the full implementation of, of, the, of, the, of the act or the, the mandate. And um, if I could just um, Senator, do you use the question? With regard, to, with regard to the concern about um, support and training and all of that, under Section 5, page 3, 
line 19, uh, there is a line there that we inserted that reads that the Department of Revenue and Taxation shall work with the Office of Technology in implementing the objectives of this chapter. Um, I also want to point out that when you, when, in, in considering all the things that are, that are being mentioned here, we have concerns about whether we can determine if they're current with taxes and, you know, and this is a good reason to have it all in one. Well, you know, at any given time, we can determine whether we're current in taxes when we go for, for clearances. Um, when we request clearances, it, it, it's, it's looking at a system. And, and one would expect that if it's staggered, these thousands of people are staggered over 12 months, that it's actually a lot easier than, the, than thousands coming in, you know, over okay. a condensed period of either up to two months online right. or Madam, up to one month okay. uh, presently. Right. I think okay. that she... You probably answered her question already. She's yeah. indicated. Okay. okay. Send okay. it on to it. Yes. So, so basically, um, okay, in that line, we're depending on the Office of Technology to come up with the software and, and the training. I'm, I'm just concerned that one of the, the concerns that had been articulated by revenue and tax is that they currently really don't have the manpower to do this to have this done. And so they're not seeing how this can be implemented. And so if we're going to require a far, um, a new software that's far more complex, that is going to also capture who has not renew, who has not paid their taxes, um, if we're going to uh, require a, a software that that will have multiple functions, I would think that we should at least have some kind of um, fiscal impact uh, regarding this. I, I just want to be clear, I want this to work. I would want our business community to be accommodated, for after all, the government exists, we exist to provide support for our community. But I'm, as it is written right now, I'm concerned that the in, upon the enactment, which seems to be in a month, that's my interpretation, that we're not going to provide the, the kind of support for the division or the department that would be required to carry this out. And carrying this out is not as simple as just learning the software. There's just a lot of things that could go wrong, even with the software and the programming of the software. Not to mention how much it might cost to purchase that software and, and how much time the employees will need. So this is a big undertaking that I believe should be undertaken. And as I had noted, the 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 author, to me, you know, is forward thinking in doing this. I'm, I'm just concerned that it's far more complex. And I would, I would really recommend that I don't, I don't have a suggested um, amendment that would be inserted here right now, but I, I really would recommend that we, we provide the kind of support that is needed to to implement this by either having a, a commission or a group together that will work this out, make the recommendations, make sure that we have all the, the materials, the training, and the people, and that we, and they would make the re recommendations for when this would actually be implemented so it would be successful. It would be successful. So, um, Madam Speaker, I, I don't know if I would be able to, I want to be able to work out on an, um, a proposed amendment that would be inserted here, but I don't have that ready right now, so I don't know if you can go to another speaker and then I can come back. I don't have anybody else after you have indicated, okay, now I do have two, okay. So, <laughs> so what is <laughs> all of a sudden from no one to two? <laughs> 
Okay, Senator, I, I will come back to you if there's no objections from anyone. I will, uh, I do have Senator Blas and then Senator Rodriguez. So, Senator, you, can, you would have an opportunity to, and I'll come back to you. Okay. Senator Blas. Okay. You're welcome. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Senators, um, please. Sen we do, Senators, we do have somebody who is going to speak. Yes, we do. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> Senator Blas, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Spe Ma Ma Speaker. Um, I, I do have a um, proposed amendment uh, just for a point of clarity. Um, it's actually found on page 2. Um, line, four, actually line 15, uh, it starts with line 14, or I'll start with line 13, it says, charged on an annual basis, comma, commencing on the date of issuance or renewal, and ending on the day before that date of issuance in the following year. Um, I think that it's best for clarity that it says, ending on the day before the month of day, a month and day of issuance of the, in the following year. Because the date of issuance in the following year date of issuance is the date you before the that. month and day of the so what which are the words you're trying so to want the, the before that date of is, okay that date so to delete before that date um, and replace with before the month and day of issuance in the before following year. the month and day day of issuance, so you right. want to remove that date. No, yeah, because date basically says it's month, day, and year. So on line 15, your new amendment would be before the month and day of issuance in the following year. Is right. that sure? Okay, and that means to delete the two, that, two words, that and date, that right. date. Senators, do you understand the amendment? Senator, you can go proceed to explain then. Uh, uh, and the reason why, Madam Speaker, is because when you use the date, the date basically comprises of month, day, and year. So when you say the, the date of issuance in the following year, um, while you basically can understand what, what you're trying to get at, the month and date of the following year, or the, that date, which could be October 21st or October 22nd of 2015. The date is October 22nd, 22nd of 2015, if you read the way it's. So if you say the month, the day, then all you're saying is October 22nd, as opposed to October 22nd, 2015. Okay, Senators, on the um, amendment on page two, line 15, where it says before, delete the words that date and replace it with the, the month, month and day. day. So it should read before the month and day of issuance in the following year. On the amendment, no objections, so ordered. You still have the floor, Senator. I was, at, I was hoping that Senator, good Senator from Eastern. From okay, don't worry, we have Senator Rodriguez who wants okay. to speak to. So, uh, I know you're buying time for the senator. <laughs> yes. Okay, Senator Rodriguez, you're, you're recognized. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise to, um, in support of this legislation, Bill 91. You know, it was several years ago that um, Senator Tina Munya Barnes, I know she's not, um, she stepped out for a minute, um, she had actually envisioned this type of, um, of initiative. Um, you know, this was even as, as a staffer on, on, on her, in her office that I know that she was working with the Department of Revenue and Taxation to see how this can happen. And um, I, I applaud the sponsor of this legislation today because it's come this far. Um, and I, I understand the, the concerns that were raised by the Vice Speaker and also um, Senator Underwood, um, but you know, I, I just want to. You know, I just want to caution. I don't know if we're th we're 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 overthinking this um, the process. I know that um, right now they do have certain uh, licenses that they renew on a on a on an annual basis. Um, and sure, those um, 
licenses, driver's license, and I be believe uh, vehicle registrations don't require any tax clearances. However, there is already a, a mechanism. They know, you know, I mean, it's already happening, the, the renewal of, um, of certain licenses on an annual basis. And so I'm, um, I'm hoping that uh, we can really find some, some, um, some way to, to move this forward. And I, I, have, um, I have faith and trust that the employees of the department, once this is, um, if and when this legislation moves forward and passes, will come up with the, uh, the protocols and, and um, not uh, the protocols and the procedures on how to move forward. Whether I know now they're using a color coding on the um, different years that um, licenses are, are, are issued. Um, and I'm sure they can develop something, you know, either, um, you know, in, um, increasing the size of expiration or the year it needs to be, it needs to be um, renewed, just to give that sense of um, transparency so that the, um, the patrons of any business or if a revenue agent does come in, that it's easily uh, verifiable. So I'm hoping that um, whoever has an amendment is, is going to be ready. Uh, because I, I hope, I, I'm, I'm really hoping that we can move this forward because this is forward thinking. This is a, a measure that would, uh, um, would be beneficial to the business community, but also as we saw in the testimony of the director, um, uh, to their employees as well. So um, I, I stand in support of this measure. Thank you, Madam Speaker. You're welcome. On the motion, Senator Nicholas. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm the chair of the um, Committee of Oversight of the Department of Revenue and Taxation. Um, when this um, measure um, first came to my attention, uh, and, and even to this very day, I think that it's something that we can definitely um, consider moving forward. I do have one major concern that is more of a time, timeliness issue, Madam Speaker, and that is that right now the Department of Revenue and Taxation is undergoing um, multiple investigations. We have um, an investigation that just recently um, concluded in the ABC division. We have one that's resulting in um, additional charges in the driver's license division. And um, I'm getting word that there were actually terminations in another division for other issues as well. And um, I, I think that we can definitely move this matter forward. My, my biggest concern, however, is whether or not the agency is in a position to begin implementing change when um, right now I think it needs to reconsolidate. Um, management needs to focus on um, really really cracking down on, on, on the systems that are in place now. Um, one of my concerns is that in a, in a highly volatile environment where we have a lot of ongoing investigations, changing the system um, may uh, create other openings for um, uh, bad practices to kind of get um, pushed off the side or, or um, covered up. Uh, so I'm, I'm just very concerned as to the timeliness of moving this measure forward now. Uh, I would probably prefer that we consider doing this um, after we've settled uh, a lot of the ongoing investigations. I even transmitted a letter to the governor saying, you know, Mr. Governor, based on some oversight hearings I've had in the past, there's another, there are other divisions that you may want to appoint a third party uh, investigator via, via the attorney general to actually go in and look at some of the tax collection, collection issues. And that would tie in directly with the business license renewals because if businesses were getting their license renewed when they weren't paying their taxes, that's something that really needs to get uh, addressed. You know, how are some businesses able to do that while others weren't? How are some businesses able to continue operating with renewed licenses when they weren't paying their taxes? That's, I think, another shoe that can probably drop over there in that, in that um, agency. And I know that there's other, there may be another bill on our session um, with respect to um, kind of touching the Department of Revenue and Taxation. At this juncture, I'm very uncomfortable with us making any kind of changes until we've cleared the air and we've gotten through this period of um, crackdown, which I very much support. We cannot have any, any doubt in any of our government services, but most particularly in the one that's responsible for all the regulation and all the taxes and the reissuing of the business licenses. So um, uh, with that in mind, uh, I would like to, for us to consider moving this measure forward, but perhaps at a later time. So I'd like to make a motion that we, um, we refer Bill 91-33 back to committee, and I will work with the sponsor in good faith to move this matter forward as soon as we've cleared the air up at the agency. But as, as, of, as of this time, as the chair, 
of the Department of Urban Taxation. I'm just very concerned uh, about potentially implementing change when management might not have the time to do it because they're focusing on the problems right now. Um, and when that potential change may disrupt any future ongoing, future or ongoing investigations in the agency that uh, really need to be um, fully vetted before we begin working on the improvements. Madam Speaker, that, that, I, I, I would like to make that motion. The um, sponsor objects, and then that is, you know, a motion is really not uh, debatable. Um, so, all in favor then of uh, sending the bill 91 33 back to the committee, please raise your hand. The motion fails. Uh, Senator Underwood, are you ready with your amendment? Is it long? No, no, no. It's actually because otherwise we have to have copies made. make that the first sentence? So the first sentence, the Department of Revenue and Taxation shall work with the Office of Technology in providing adequate training on the objectives? For the implement, for the, for implementing the objectives of this chapter? For implementing okay, the objectives the, of this of chapter? of this chapter, okay. That would be, I'm, I'm, um, suggesting, a, I'm suggesting that would be the first sentence. And then these changes to the terms of business licenses shall be effective. Given, given the concerns that had been noted about the readiness of revenue and tax to implement this, I would like to proffer this amendment that these changes to the term of business licenses shall be effective. On point of, point on of order, Madam Speaker. We have yes. amendment that was proposed in front of us uh, okay. that we haven't disposed of just yet. Is, wasn't that an amendment that she made to the no, initial she's one? Not, she's not yet done. She, she, was just, she just read the, the first sentence. You want me to do that? I'm reordering that. Okay, well, so no, she's going through now. The first, the first amendment is a sentence in section five. Correct. Uh, you're right, and that is providing adequate training for the for implementing the okay, objectives of this chapter. Correct, and that, that is the amendment that we are supposed to be addressing at this time, unless there is an extra wording to go along with the amendment to the to the amendment that she's just inserting now. Well, that's I'm not sure how I'm, we can move that's on. That's what I'm. I'm. That's she is continuing the sentence. Okay, I'm sorry. But she's she, but she's doing it one at a time only because we don't have it uh, Xerox for everybody. Do you want me and, to and eventually we'll get Can a I copy. Just... So we'll just get a recess then and get a, okay. a copy for everybody. All right.
legislature's back in session. Uh, Senator Underwood, you're recognized. Thank Has you, everybody received the um, amendment? Please. Okay. Thank you, um, Mr. Speaker. On page uh, three, line 18 of the bill um, would read section five, effective date, the Department of Revenue and Taxation shall work with the Office of Technology in providing adequate training for implementing the objectives of this chapter. These changes to the terms, term of business licenses shall be made effective on the second day of October 2016. And the reason why, yes? Yes. I can ask any questions. Okay. So the reason why I had moved it to um, October 2016 is, again, to provide revenue and tax uh, the opportunity to um, be prepared to implement this, get the training, and identify uh, the necessary resources and actually really make sure that this can work. So by giving them um, a year to do this, I'm hoping that uh, all of those questions that had been raised and the concerns that had been raised by um, the previous speakers uh, would be addressed. But then again, I want to reiterate, uh, Mr. Speaker, that the intent of this bill is really very good and it will uh, provide support uh, for the businesses and um, I'm asking um, uh, your support, my colleagues' support in um, supporting this uh, amendment that uh, I'm proffering. Thank you. On the um, Underwood Amendment, any senator wish to be heard? On the Underwood Amendment, Senator James Espaldon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, I guess it comes, if I may ask a question, not so much of the uh, proffer of this amendment, but really to the author of the, of the uh, bill itself, and, and it's concerning this amendment. So if I may, if you just give me a little latitude on that part. Uh, and the question uh, would be that in her, in her original bill, in the bill that she puts before us, it says the Department of Revenue and Taxation shall work with the Office of the Technology in implementing the objectives of this chapter. The, in the amendment, it's changed to provide the Office of, of, to work with the Office of Technology in providing adequate training. And so it's a more of a limited scope than it is a broader scope. And I guess the question I have to the author is if that's what she intended when she put her version in her bill. In other words, it was a more general scope that the Office of Technology perhaps would not only just work with training, but might be also work with the systems and, and whatnot. Whereas this amendment now comes down to a very narrow uh, assistance to, uh, to Rev and Tax in terms of just training. So if I could ask the author of the bill is if that was her intention to keep it as broad as possible so that uh, Rev and Tax could avail themselves of whatever, whatever expertise the Office of Technology might be able to provide. To yield, Senator. Yes, Mr. Speaker. Um, to the retiring speaker, that is, that is exactly um, the intention I, I had intended by including the words um, working with them and <coughs> implementing the objectives as being all-encompassing and to provide whatever need was necessary. So uh, yes, you are correct in your assessment. Uh, uh, then, then in that case, um, perhaps if I would then have to ask the proffer of the amendment why she would just narrowly focus in on just providing the training as opposed to other assistance that the Office of Technology might be able to provide. Do you yield, Senator Underwood? Please. Mr. Speaker, I do appreciate um, uh, the, the good speaker's um, attention to this, and I, I do agree. This does narrow the scope of support that would be provided by the Office of Technology, and so I guess I would withdraw my amendment relative to just the training, because if we left it, the Department of Revenue and Taxation shall work with the Office of Technology in implementing the objectives of this chapter that leaves it, that includes the software, the training, and so on. So I withdraw my uh, amendment relative to providing adequate training because that would be incorporated in that initial uh, statement that had been made there. 
So if purposes the clerk, the only amendment is going to be our second day of October 2016. Yes, um, the only, but I did re, I did rearrange the sentence so that that sentence, the Department of Revenue and Taxation, I shall work with the Office of Technology and implement the objectives of this chapter. That would be the first sentence, and then these changes to the term of business licenses shall be made effective on the second day of October 2016. Okay. So what, what are you withdrawing? So I'm withdrawing that uh, first amendment where I had noted in providing adequate training for all three lines. No. Only the, Only the double underline. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Are you satisfied, Senator? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. A any objection to Senator Underwood withdrawing her double underlined amendment and leaving it the original? Hearing no objection. No objection. On the um, changing of the date to um, on the changing of the date, anybody wish to speak? The day after the beginning of the fiscal year. Any any objection to the date? None. Thank you. Anything further, Senator Underwood? No, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Okay. Um, Senator Speaker Wampat. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. You know, as I listen intently to uh, the discussion, and that's the one great thing is that when our colleagues start to come up one by one and you know, start to analyze, of course, and ask questions and present, you know, examples of uh, how this will work and how would it then become business friendly. And the author, of course, have indicated that this was a, a request of uh, the Chamber of Commerce. And, and I know in the Chamber of Commerce there are different business uh, uh, sectors who are part of uh, the, the Chamber. The question, though, that, that I have in my mind that I like uh, our colleagues to think about in particular is that when, I mean, the bill basically says that on the original date in which an individual, an applicant has gone in to get an, uh, a license, and it could go as far back as 30 years, 40 years, and the problem that I see with that, and, and I, normally government would keep records of, of course, for maybe what, 10 years, and then the rest would be filed in boxes elsewhere. Um, what they would do is that, I don't know if they have the capability now to go all the, back, all the way back uh, 30, 40 years to find out what the original date uh, was of the application. But even greater than that, and I'm thinking primarily of property managers. These are any one of the, the real estate companies who manage uh, properties for individuals or uh, individuals or business people, I suppose, is that uh, there are multiple, multiple licenses. And I've seen individual go, individuals go to Revin Tax to renew it. And we wonder why is it taking so long is because they have stacks of uh, licenses uh, to renew and fortunately now you were able to do this online but then those who also then have uh, multiple licenses to to renew you could very well see any one of these property managers not just there now for any one specific date but rather could very well find themselves at Revin tax every month uh, you know, to be able to renew all the licenses that could, if they check back to the first original date in which they applied, that 
they're all going to be very different. And, and to me, then that's definitely, at least for property managers, that that's not going to be uh, a business-friendly uh, operation for them. I think it's going to be a nightmare uh, for them having to uh, go back and go at the different months in which they were first applied and because of various uh, properties that they're managing, uh, to me it would just be a nightmare. And I, and I, I don't know if uh, there is an answer uh, to this uh, question in terms of how then will revenue tax be able to, to do this? How then are we making this uh, easier and friendly for property managers? I can think only of those primarily as having so many to take care of and renewing licenses. You know, uh, some companies I know that they would have different names of their businesses, but I don't know whether they would have 10, 12, 15, 20, 30 of those. The only ones I can think of are property managers. And I mean, I, please excuse me for my ignorance in terms of uh, how many other businesses that uh, would have so many branches from a, a mother company or primary company uh, that I don't know. I'm, I'm not knowledgeable in terms of th those kinds of businesses on island. But the only ones that I'm familiar with are property managers because I, you know, I'm putting myself in their shoe as well because uh, there are, I mean, I am a small businesswoman. And um, I could very well, maybe not every month, but surely a couple of months. So, thank you very much, Mr. Vice Speaker. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any other senator wish to be heard? I'll just take a short recess so I can return the speakership to the speaker. The, legisl the legislature is back in session. I don't have uh, anyone on the list. Is there anybody else who is interested in speaking? There being none, so the primary uh, author, if you you're, have an opportunity to close. Madam Speaker, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank my colleagues for some very constructive and thorough dialogue on this bill. Anytime there are changes to processes, you know, clearly we, we think about what the ramifications are. And there are, always, there are always pluses and there are always minuses. But I think when we, when we look at what the, the pluses are and what the potential good of, of a piece of legislation like this is, is it's consistent with what we're doing moving forward in government. We're moving forward with efficiencies, we're moving forward with uh, making things more amenable and easy for our constituencies to use. We're also taking advantage of, of technological improvements. And we're essentially just promoting a good environment. Now, given that there are a lot of present problems and, and uh, restrictions maybe with the department, shouldn't preclude us from planning to move forward. And I want to I wanna, uh, thank uh, one of my colleagues for, for moving back the date. Uh, if there are concerns with us being able to do something right now, uh, maybe a little bit of time is good. Uh, if we need to understand what the, the if in any there are some uh, financial 
implications of this, then we can address that at the next budget cycle. So that, that was a very good thing to give us a little bit of time, give all of us a little bit of time. But I think what this does, it, it, in my estimate, what this does is it really gives us an avenue to improve. It allows us to have a continuing stream of, of revenue that throughout the year, it staggers the, um, the renewal of business licenses so that, that uh, you know, everybody has a sense of room and they're not, there isn't this mad rush uh, to do anything. And then it also will train perhaps the department and, and to be more uh, cognizant and, and able to extract business license and tax, um, whether people are, are, are truly uh, conforming to the tax laws and whether they are remitting their taxes uh, timely. So it, it gives us, because it's staggered now, it gives everybody a little more breathing room. And to the, to the idea that, that you know, it, it can be an inconvenience if you're a multiple license holder, well, when we manage things nowadays, technology provides us, many of us, the ability to, to multitask. And I don't see that, that, um, that this necessarily is a physical impediment because we, we can and put it in our calendar systems, uh, electronic calendar systems. And when the calendar systems prompt us, we can very conveniently go online and renew. So it, I see many good things coming from this, but mostly it, it demonstrates where this government uh, is focused. And it's focused on forward movement. It's focused on having an, a, 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 the ability to do things instantaneously, easily, and at our convenience and leisure. And part of the convenience is having staggered terms as opposed to um, being forced into one, one uh, renewal date only. But I, I want to uh, just, I want to thank my colleagues for bringing out some very healthy discussion. And I also want to um, just confirm my commitment to, to facilitating the business community that does move and support uh, our existence and our, our economy on this island. So with that, I, I, in closing, I'd just like to ask my colleagues uh, if you have any further reservations. Um, I would be happy to discuss this if need be, but uh, please keep an open mind because at one point I remember doing business at Revintax that revolved carbon copies and that was the way that we made multiple copies of things. I mean, things have, have transpired in our short lifetimes, and, uh, and it can only move forward in a more convenient way. And so I ask for your support. You're welcome, Senator. So on the motion to send 91-33 to third reading file without any objections, so ordered. Um, Senator, Tom Adda, are you ready for Bill 137-33? Thank, thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I move to place uh, Bill 137-33 as substituted by the author uh, in third reading. And, okay, this is a substitute, yes. Senator, you may proceed. Thank you. Uh, Madam Speaker, um, Bill 137-33 seeks to correct um, really kind of a, um, an injustice that was committed um, long ago when uh, the owner of a piece of private property agreed to exchange his property for um, another piece of government property on a area for area basis. And the exchange was made so that we could have access into what is now the Okudu High School. Um, however, when the exchange was made, it was then realized that there was actually a um, easement a uh, military utility easement that goes right down the middle of that property that was given to him in exchange. And that property uh, measures in area 
of approximately um, approximately 766 square meters. And so what the bill proposes to do then is to uh, give the pr this private landowner uh, as to compensate for this easement which really is of no value to him because he cannot build over it um, an area that's equal uh, to to this um, utility easement uh, on government property that is contiguous to the new property that he has. So uh, that's what Bill 137-33 does. And he is currently, uh, and actually has been in communications with the, uh, the Navy to try and get that military easement uh, to be shifted down to the edge of the boundary uh, so that then he will have full use of the property uh, and not be constrained by this utility easement that's currently going right down the middle of the property. That's basically his responsibility and he has been getting favorable responses back from uh, the Navy uh, with regards to the shifting of the, um, of the, the easement. And so, um, so really, Bill 137-33 is simple. It's just to compensate the individual for uh, 766 square meters of property that is of no value to him because it's a utility easement. And I would ask my uh, colleagues to favorably consider the bill. Thank you. You're welcome, Senator. On the motion? Anybody would like to speak on the motion? On Bill 137? Senator, is, is, are you looking for the bill so you can speak? Senator Duggan? Okay, you're recognized. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, I, just, I would just uh, like to stand up very briefly and, and uh, extend my support for this particular legislation. I believe the family had uh, ventured to reach out to most of the senators, if not all the senators in the hall, to be able to explain exactly what the predicament is. And the good chair of land has, has not only recognized it, but also is, is looking at the original intent of the legislation in terms of being able to compensate this family. And it just so happened that there's a, a federal easement that is, is going through his entire property and he's, this particular legislation would rectify it. So I certainly stand in support of this, Madam Speaker, and I encourage our colleagues to do likewise. Thank you, Madam Speaker. You're welcome, Senator. On the motion? Is there anybody else who'd like to speak? Senator, do you want to close and try to send it down? And the motion to send 137-33 to the third reading file without any objections, so ordered. Bill number 144-33, Senator Frank Bloss, Jr., you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, I'd like to move to place Bill number 144-33 COR as amended by the Committee on Appropriations and Adjudication. Um, mm -hmm. to third reading, uh, but I'd also like the opportunity to speak to it, please. You may, may proceed, Senator. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, Madam Speaker, uh, Bill 144-33, and I, I, I want to give thanks again to the, to the committee, as well as to the legal counsel for being able to assist in, in, in being able to, to come up with a, uh, a product, and albeit the, the, I'll be making several amendments to be able to clarify some, some positions in, in the bill, and to my co-sponsor uh, of the legislation. Um, the, what the bill provides is a mechanism and an understanding of just basically what our government uh, receives on an annual basis um, in uh, bas basically federal grants, federal uh, receipts, the, the, the uh, federal funding um, that we use to be able to operate our government. Now, I know that there are some, and, it's, it's, and there have, there, the uh, Clearinghouse has, has basically stated, Senator, we do this already. And I, and I recognize this. I recognize that there is a process already of being able to identify 
uh, and hopefully so, really, um, all the federal receipts that our government receives. But it's what we do with that information um, that this bill, this bill hopes to, to, to provide and hopes to do. Um, you know, Madam Speaker, in the, in the last budget process, you know, one of the things that I, that I noticed is, you know, the, the amount of money that we spend on federal matching, uh, the, the grants in aid, and the, and the federal matching requirements that we have in, with different agencies. And well, the concern that I had here is based on the amount of monies that we, funding that we receive from the federal government, just on that category alone, the issue and the concern that I had there is, first off, what truly are we spending, uh, did we receive that funding for? What are we spending it on? But more importantly, how, the two things is, how does that fit into the operational requirements and the operational needs of that particular agency? And what happens to the operations of that agency should that federal funding expire or should it go away? And do, is there a mitigative effort? Is there a, is there a plan to be able to mitigate what may occur should that funding, should we lose that funding? Okay? Um, and that's what, the, the, that's what this, this, this legislation intends to provide. It further it intends to provide that once that information is gathered um, and you know, part of that gathering information is for the agencies to actually come up with a plan. Come up with a plan of what we're going to do should that funding expire or should that funding no longer exist. And that, that funding is necessary for the operations of that agency. What does that mean for us? Once that report, report is, 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 is uh, created and it's transmitted, then it becomes the information that not only the administration can share or can use in as far as the planning, but also for this body to recognize and to take action if necessary um, to be able, again, to ensure that the operations of the government don't stop or we can basically fend off or, or, or avoid, you know, what may occur if the funding was no longer exist in existence and that operations and that and the operations no longer exist um so that's what it is ma'am and along those lines what i want to do is for the purposes of be of of clarity and there's there's a couple of amendments that i'd like to be able to make and the first one madam speaker is found on page two um line 20. And where it says reports the aggregate amount of federal funds appropriated by the legislature. First off, we don't appropriate federal funds, but what we do is we appropriate the monies for the federal matching grants and aid. So what I want to do is strike out the words federal funds and add the words funds for federal matching grants and aid. So that way it's appropriate. That's, that's the money we appropriate. Is the matching is, is the monies that we have to match for the for the federal grants. So the words are funds for federal matching. Grants in aid. Grant. Grants in aid. Grants in aid. And that's the, the same nomenclature that we use in our budget. Okay. So on page two, line twenty, delete federal funds and add the words funds for federal matching grants in aid. And then everything else will be will continue. Any objections? Anybody like to speak on it? So order. No objections. And then, Madam Speaker, the next uh, amendments will be actually it's, it's strikeouts. Um, it's found on page three, basically beginning in line twelve, and then also in line fifteen. Line twelve it says strike out the words and political subdivision. And political subdivision. And then on line 15, this line 15, it says, or political subdivision. And Strike or that out. Or political subdivision. Does everybody understand that and following? So then, is there any objection to the deletion on page 3, line 12 and 13, and political subdivision? The same language on line 15 with the word or political subdivision. No objections, so ordered. 
still have the four senator. And then the last, actually the last two is relative to where the reports are going to be going, and that will be found again on page three, starting on line 21, where it says uh, to the Appropriations Committee, and after conferring with uh, the, actually the chair of the Appropriations Committee, I think it's best that the report actually go to the Office of Finance and Budget. So strike out the words Appropriations Committee and put in Office of, fi of Finance and Budget. Okay, on page 3, line 21, delete Appropriations Committee and add the words Office of Finance and Budget. Any objection? No objection? Is that? So, so ordered. No, and the other one is just to make sure that it's, 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 it's consistent, it's in line. Okay, line 24, uh, okay. where it says the chair of the appropriations committee to be consistent with the is office is strike out the chair of the appropriations committee and submit and 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 uh, place office of finance and budget. Okay, again on page three, to be consistent on line 24, delete appropriations committee and put office of finance and budget. Any objection? No, 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 I said that take out the chair. Take the, out the, the chair? chair? Of the okay, of the take out the chair. Right. Mr. Vice Speaker, you're recognized. While I have no objection to taking out the chair, I really do think that protocol requires that it go to the Speaker to be transmitted to the Office of Finance and Budget. I don't want to bypass the process by which we receive And I, and I recognize that, Madam Speaker, if I could ask the legal counsel to go in and make that appropriate. Uh, Okay. okay. To ensure that appropriate language. All right. I yes. do apologize. I know that the good good uh, senator from PD wanted to see yes. he can get me in trouble. Because normally that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you're right, and he's oh. correct. Because every time it comes to the speaker's office, and automatically. I understand, Madam Speaker. Proper, I appreciate that. It was just his. It, it was just his, his attempt to get me in trouble. Yes. With you. And uh, so there's no objection then that he wants the other fifty percent. will make the the appropriate change then. Yes, ma'am. Uh, based so, on legislative protocol. So that's why, Madam Speaker. So uh, no objection to that motion. Then that the, our legal counsel then will take care of this. So I, 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 when you were saying that, I was looking at legal counsel to making sure that. Yes, okay, and I want she, to remind her that I, I did, I did save, the exact same thing. I saved her other 50%. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> You're very welcome. Okay, with that, Madam Speaker, I, I, you know, um, I, I will listen intently to any suggestions and any comments that uh, um, members of this body would make with regards to this piece of legislation. I ask, though, for, uh, for the support um, of our colleagues. I, I, I firmly believe this is something that's necessary to ensure that we recognize first off where our funding is coming in how is it being used but more importantly what do we need to do should that funding source uh, um, not be there or be redu drastically reduced thank you very much madam speaker you're very welcome on the motion then on 144 i have senator sir nicholas and then senator tony Adler. thank you madam speaker uh, madam speaker i rise in full support of this piece of legislation i think that it's um a very prudent thing for us to do in our government. I've observed over the years um, sometimes when federal funding would no longer be available, available for positions and our default action in this body would just be to appropriate local funds to continue the federal program. And I would sit back and I would ask myself, if the federal government funded it and they felt that it was no longer necessary to fund in the interest of the nation, you know, are we really so compelled to fund it in the interest of the territory? So this will really give us an, an idea of um, you know, not only where those programs are at that are federally funded, but if the money is no longer going to be there, exactly how are we going to continue that? Um, I, I would be very interested if the auditor were to go in and kind of do a study as to how much um, local expenses today are a result of federal programs that were started, that were closed, that we carried on of local money. It'd be very interesting to know how much money we're spending on that. Because then the question becomes, are federal grants really money coming in to help us that we should welcome with open arms all the time? Or are they sending us down a course through which we're constantly carrying a heavier and heavier load, whether or not it really is aligned with what's in the best interest of what we want to achieve as a local government? So that's, I think, something that we really need to be mindful of. I think this legislation will help us to get a better understanding of that. But um, I, I think that this should be also taken into the context where in the future, as we 
talk about spending and we talk about appropriating, just because federal funds is running out for something, even if it's affecting positions, doesn't mean that we should just rush in with local money and fund it right away. I mean, I know that we don't like to affect positions, but maybe we need to be a bit more forthcoming with the people who are in those positions um, with respect to maybe the reporting coming out of this that says, hey, you know what? Your position got funded, your position's gonna continue to be funded for the next three years, but after that, you need to really begin figuring out what your um, future plans are going to be. Because we cannot just all of a sudden turn on the local spigot to keep carrying over the federal program when the whole intent of bringing in that federal program may have already been satisfied. That being said, Madam Speaker, I do have an amendment I would like to proffer um, on page three, line two. But before I do, I guess I just wanted to ask the, the mover of the, um, the legislation uh, when I read page three, section D, it reads, de de develops a plan for operating the designated state agency if there is a reduction in the federal receipt that the designated state agency, the, de the designated agency receives. Now these plans are supposed to be for the federal money, but the way I read it, it just reads a little too, too um, broad for me because obviously the plan for operating the agency if there's a reduction in federal receipts would be to increase the local appropriation or just to continue operating the agency without really worrying about what the federal receipt's impact is going to be to the overall agency. I think more specifically, the question should be, what's the plan for operating the designated state agency federal program if there is a reduction in the federal receipt that the state agency receives? Because if it's a federal, if it's a federal receipt, it's usually going to fund a federal program with any particular agency. So for example, if, um, public health is receiving a grant for a certain project, um, if that grant goes away, if we use the, the, the current operating language, the question is how is public health going to continue to operate? Well, the way it's always operated with an appropriation from the Guam legislature. But the question more specifically should be, if that particular grant goes away, how does those particular programs plan on continuing to operate? Or are we being very upfront and saying that they're going to sunset when there's no more federal funds? So I guess my question to the um, mover of the legislation is, are we, do you want to make it more specific to the, to the um, direct federal program that's affected by the federal receipt, or did you still want to leave it open-ended for the agency? Because if it's open-ended for the agency, I don't think that, the, that we're gonna get the answer that we're necessarily looking for. I, I go to the ahead. question? Yes, yes, I do, Madam Speaker. And I, you know, it's a great suggestion from, from and a question from, from the, uh, the good senator. And he's right, you know, what we wanted to basically do is specifically how does this, you know, the, this federal funding that they receive for this, for this program, should something happen, you're right, how does it affect that particular program? And if that program has an effect on the overall operations, how does it affect that? So it's more of a domino thing. Uh, the, the initially first is how would, that, how would the agency run if that program were to long, no longer exist? Okay. And other question is, if it is in fact necessary, how do we intend? And I, I see his point is, you're recognizing that it's very easy for an agency to say, well, then I just need, you know, X amount of dollars from the local appropriations to be able to complete this. How, absent that, how do you intend to run this? Because he's absolutely right, Madam Speaker. I've, I've found that in a number of times. What we find is agencies that go out and, and you know, they go to these conferences, uh, you know, and they walk past this table and they say, this is a great plan, here's a great program, uh, we have the money for you, and if money will be made available for you, and then it'll be graduated matching funds, you know, throughout the years, uh, and then after 10 years, you own the whole, th whole thing. And then what happens is then now we're stuck with a program that we have to, to fund. And so, I, yeah, I agree. I agree with, 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 the, with the good senator. And uh, I look forward and, you know, to, make, to make the proper amendments in this so that it can, uh, it can clarify that. Thank you. So, Senator, are you satisfied then with the uh, Yes, Madam response? Speaker, thank you. And okay. thank you to the author. So I, I would like to proffer an amendment on page three, line two, after the word agency. Uh, place a comma after the word agency and include the words and its affected federal program or programs. So program with a parentheses S comma. And that's it. I'm sorry, can you repeat that again uh, so that the clerks would write it? After the word agency, add the words and its affected federal program. 
or programs. So it'll be program with a parenthesis S after the M. And it's affected federal programs. And it's effective federal programs with parenthesis S. Then it continues on with that if there is. That's right. Okay, on the amendment. Does anyone like to speak on it? Okay, I'm hearing no objections. So order. You stay at the floor, Senator. Thank you, Madam Speaker. That, that pretty much concludes it. I'm very, um, I'm very interested in this bill. I think it'll be a very good thing, a very good operational tool for our government. And again, uh, if the public auditor is listening, that would be something very interesting for her to take a look at. Um, how many federal programs have we had come through our system that have, um, where the federal funding has gone away, but the local funding has absorbed 100% of it? And what really is the efficacy of these programs um, after the federal money has run out? Uh, or, or did they just serve to um, kind of be an indirect way to continue to bloat government operations without it being really targeted towards what we want to achieve as a government? So um, with that, Madam Speaker, um, I, I, I really look forward to the passage of Bill 144. It has my full support. Thank you. You're very welcome. On the motion, Senator Tony Anna, you're recognized. Okay. Is there anybody else who would like to speak on the motion? Senator Ugin, you're recognized. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I certainly stand in support of the uh, proposed measure, but if I can, perhaps this is something that may have skipped by me on page two. On line one, if I can just uh, recommend the legal counsel correct the grammar there, because it reads designated state agency means agency means any. So obviously, one of those or two of those words should be deleted. So just, just so that it's grammatically correct. But I stand in support, Madam Speaker, certainly of this legislation. And, and let me just share a personal experience in regards to some of these programs that have been very, very effective and supportive of our island community. And the agreement and the understanding from the federal granting agency is that we will initially fund these programs or these positions, and then the local government would have to step in. Excellent example. We have four police officer ones today who are funded under the COPS program. It is a three-year funding mechanism so that the local community can be able to recruit these additional personnel and then transition them to local funding support. So that's one program that we know is very beneficial to our community in terms of bringing additional outside resources. Another one is the adult drug code program. When that was initiated and one of our colleagues was at the judiciary of Guam, it was a three-year funding mechanism. After three years, they legitimately came to this body, provided statistics and information in terms of how that program was be beneficial to the community, and then we made that policy that in terms of transitioning and providing that local funding so that they can continue that program. And to this very day, every quarter event or twice a year, they graduate individuals out of the adult drug code program with the recidivism rate extremely low, even below the national average. Also, another complementary program is the juvenile drug code program. That was another program that we received federal funds for over three years, a time frame, and the understanding was that after three years, you, that should be ample time to be able to get the program up and running and for you to justify the existence of the program with local funding if, in fact, the, the local community would like to continue to see those programs exist. And then finally, let me say this much, and the Veterans Treatment Court last year received funding. And the funding arrangement, based on information that was provided to me, is a very similar structure. They provided the seed money. They're providing a three-year mechanism so that, in fact, those, those funds can be utilized, get the Veterans treat, Treatment Court up and running, and then the local community ultimately will have to step in and absorb that particular cost. Madam Speaker, from the adult drug court to the juvenile drug court to the COPS program to the Veterans Treatment Court, these are all programs that originated and have originated with funding support from their federal granting en entity, and then eventually this community, with the exception of the Veterans Treatment Court, because the timeline has yet to be exhausted, have all transitioned to local funds. So I consider certainly this legislation would bring to the attention of not only the chair of the Appropriations Committee, but members of this body that if, in fact, there are time restrictions on the use of these federal funds, then obviously we need to take into consideration 
other funding options, whether it be local general fund or other funding options so that we can continue these programs if that's a desire of this policy making body. So I, I certainly stand and commend the sponsor, sponsors of this particular legislation, Madam Speaker. It will provide the necessary information and it would allow we as, as part of this August body and future members the opportunity to be able to plan effectively at least within the, next, the foreseeable two or three or four or five years. So thank you very much and I support this legislation. Thank you. You're welcome, Senator. And also uh, legal counsel and clerks have duly noted to make sure that we make those technical corrections on page two, line one. Is there anybody else who would like to speak on the motion? There being none, Senator Bloss, would you like to close? Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I want to thank the, uh, the, my, my colleagues for uh, the dialogue, as well as for the, the amendments that uh, actually uh, made for a stronger bill. Um, I just basically want to leave this, you know, with one thing. What really struck me is if you, in our last budget, and federal grants in aid requiring local match, the Department of Public Health and Social Services, um, this was $29,581,433. That's the requirement. You know, and if it's for 50%, that basically comes out to about $15 million, at least. That this body would have to try to figure out if the, if the federal matching, if the federal programs were to expire, were to run out, or just basically disappear that then we would have to scurry, come back into this body and look for $15 million to make sure that we've got public health services. Because there's no plan right now. And so what this, that's what this legislation will provide. I want to thank the good senator from Zonia here with regards to the, the suggestion of the judiciary. You know, as much as I feel that maybe, yeah, they, they should be a part of this. I've, in all fairness, um, I, I think that the best route to take so that we can bring them in, so that we can talk to them about this is, Hopefully that this bill does pass and is signed by the governor and then make the amend pro appropriate legislation to amend this to include the judiciary. But this, this will give us, the, again, as you stated, um, give us a tool, the better tool to understand the workings of the government, how much it really costs to operate the government and what we're going to need if we were to run this government totally under our budget. So I want to, I'm hoping you know, for the support of um, every member of this body um, I'm hoping for that support, ma'am, and with that, I'd like to move this to third reading. Okay. So, in the motion in to send 144-33 to third reading file without any objections. So, ordered. Senator Munya Barnes uh, for Bill 111. Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, may I just move to set that aside? Okay. I did receive some information from GPD that they're looking into before they can work the MOU. So I, I'd like to know if I can just set that aside for a sure. while. Sure, not a problem. No. Senator Rodriguez on 145-33. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, move to place Bill 145-33. On the third reading, be allowed to... Okay, and that's as introduced? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you, Senator. So, yes, you may proceed. Thank you. Madam Speaker, Bill 145, um, what this does is to is, is adds the Bureau of Economic Security Program um, under the De Department of Public Health and Social Services into existing law that uh, allows them to... Um, um, that allows them to be able to use joinder or mutual use contracts, um, including this this bureau um, into the statutory um, uh, authority to 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 be able to use a joinder or mutual use contracts, would allow for the sharing of procurement uh, with existing contracts of other government agencies to achieve economies of scale and volumes of bulk purchasing. Um, allowing the Economic Bureau of Security to participate in the Western State States Electronic Benefits Transfer Services contract with uh, Western States EBT Alliance um, would um, would allow our uh, the program, which is federally funded, 
to be able to um, really maximize um, the amount that it's used to, to contract for these services. I, I must state, Madam Speaker, that uh, currently um, the Bureau, the Department of Public Health, who receives these, these federal funds to um, operate the EBT program, already uses um, mutual use contracts. They've been using it for, for several years. However, um, it, it has come to the attention of the, um, the grand tours, federal grand tours, and also our local attorney general's office that a statutory provision needs to be included um, uh, moving forward. And so this is uh, um, at the request of the department. Um, this, this measure was um, put together in consultation and guidance by the attorney general's office. So I'm hoping my colleagues would, um, would support the inclusion of the Bureau of Economic Security uh, just like we did several uh, years ago in including the WIC program, the Women, and Infants, and Children program into this um, authority into enter into joinder and mutual use contracts. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Welcome, Senator. On the motion, is there anyone of our colleagues who would like to speak on Bill 145? There being none, then, so on the motion to send 145-33 to the third reading file, no objection, so order. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to recess until tomorrow morning at 9.